people find their life partners in the most unlikely of places. I found mine in front of a high school bathroom. Some people find theirs while walking down the street, but a lot of people find their other halves on social media, while others might meet through mutual friends and hit it off. Well, that's exactly how 20-year-old Renee Marsden and 23-year-old Brayden Spiteri hit it off like a house on fire. Renee was convinced that Brayden was her soulmate, and they even made plans for their future together. But if everything was perfect, then what led Renee to The Gap, a dangerous cliff overlooking thrashing waters of the Tasman Sea in the evening hours of August 5th, 2013, where she would tragically end her own life? At least, that's how the official story was told. The case of Renee Marsden is not as straightforward as it seems, and it's weaved with lies and obsession and a secret that was hidden in plain sight. A secret that led to lethal consequences. If you're like me, you're probably super interested in true crime. And if so, I'd be willing to bet you'd be interested in this channel, True Crime Stories. So do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button below. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future cases. YouTube tells me that over 40% of you guys are not subscribed, so click that button and help us both out. Renee Marsden was born on October 15, 1992, to parents Teresa and Jamie in New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. She lived in Prairiewood, Fairfield City. But sadly, soon after her birth, Renee's parents decided to end their marriage and they went their separate ways. Now, going through a divorce is an unnerving experience for any family, but another person came into Renee's life when she was just five years old, who she called father and even took his last name. This was Teresa's new boyfriend, Mark Marsden. Teresa and Mark soon got married and they had three more children, Luke, Jake, and Monique, and Renee loved their family to bits. According to her mom, Teresa, Renee was a kind, joyful, and sociable girl who got along well with her siblings. Teresa and Renee also shared a mother-daughter bond like no other. Renee would share everything with her mom, and Teresa was Renee's go-to person whenever she needed advice or comfort. Renee was a very outgoing and independent young girl, and in 2010, when Renee was 18 years old, she was working as an administrator at a salon. See, Renee had dreams of becoming a successful hairdresser, and she loved dolling her clients up when it came to their hair. So the salon was a perfect place to polish her skills and train to become one. But this is where she met someone, a man named Angus Young. Angus was Renee's first love, and he described her as a bubbly, beautiful, kind, and optimistic person. Fast forward to April of 2010, and the couple were madly in love with each other, and they also talked seriously about getting married and starting a family. Angus and Renee even went as far as planning how many kids they were going to have and what dog they were going to adopt. But their fairy tale romance didn't have a happy ending, and something happened that severely affected Renee's mental health. One day, Renee received a text message from Angus out of the blue, which stated that he wanted to break things off with her. His reasoning was that he was only using her, he wasn't ready for commitment, and he was interested in other women. Now, this absolutely crushed Renee. She and Angus were very serious about each other, and they'd been dating for a while now. So this broke something inside of Renee that caused her to become withdrawn and just not her usual self anymore. It seemed as if the bubbly and cheerful Renee was gone, and now she was just a shell of the person she used to be. But Renee's family didn't give up on her, and they tried everything they could to get Renee feeling better again. During this time, though, Renee reconnected with another pivotal person, who's going to be important for the rest of this case. It was her best friend since ninth grade, Kamala Zayden. Renee met Kamala in 2008 when they attended the all-girls Mount St. Benedict's College, and the girls bonded over mutual interests and even shared their secrets with each other. This led to the girls turning into best friends. But after graduating from the school, the two drifted apart and only met from time to time. But it wasn't long until Kamala rushed to Renee's side when she heard about the anguish her best friend was going through after her terrible and unexpected breakup with Angus. Like any best friend, Kamala suggested that Renee put herself back out there in the dating world and meet new guys. Although Renee wasn't interested, Kamala pushed her to meet other people, as it was the only way to get her mind off of things, at least in her mind. Kamala even went out of the way to suggest someone to Renee. It was none other than her ex-boyfriend, Braden Spiteri, which is kind of unusual if you think about it. Anyway, Renee, after much persuasion, decided to give 23-year-old Brayden a chance by talking to him via social media. 
it turned out that Renee actually liked the guy. Over time, Renee started to connect with Brayden, and they both decided they really liked each other. They had the same likes and dislikes, and they had similar goals in life, and everything seemed perfect. Renee was slowly coming out of that deep, dark hole of isolation and was starting to feel her normal self again. Kamala was also by Renee's side all the while, supporting her through her tough bouts of heartache. It was clear that Renee trusted Kamala a lot, but there was one problem with Brayden and his relationship with Renee, and that was the fact that Renee had never even physically seen his face or interacted with him. She'd only ever seen a photo of Brayden, and that was it. Whenever she communicated with Brayden, it was either through social media or text. Well, Renee was about to find out something very bizarre about her so-called soulmate. See, according to Kamala, Brayden came from a wealthy family and was very ambitious. But she later went on to disclose something very odd about Brayden, and it was the fact that he was currently incarcerated at Goulburn Jail for a driving offense that resulted in the death of his best friend, Richie. This was why Brayden had always turned down meeting Renee, because he was serving a prison sentence. On top of that, he'd also forfeited his visitation rights for a lesser sentence, so no one could visit him in jail. Now, I'm not an expert on incarceration, but I don't even think this is something you can do, but please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. But this was baffling on so many levels. First of all, why would Kamala ever suggest Renee start an online romantic relationship with a convict? And why did Renee agree to this? Well, it seemed that Kamala had unbelievable control over Renee, and she essentially manipulated her vulnerable best friend into starting a relationship with Brayden, with whom Renee was starting to get very attached to. Even after this revelation, Renee was supportive of Brayden, as Richie's death was tragic, but it was an accident nonetheless, and she continued her relationship with him and was counting down the days until Brayden would be released from prison, and then they could start their lives together. Brayden and Renee talked every day, but you might be thinking, how's that possible? Cell phones aren't allowed in prison. Well, surprisingly, Kamala made arrangements with an attorney for Brayden to have a mobile phone to contact Renee in prison via texts which, mind you, is illegal. This attorney literally smuggled a phone into prison for this man, a felony offense. Anyway, Renee also confided in her mom, Teresa, about her relationship with Brayden in late 2011, and even told her about his prison sentence. Teresa recalled that Renee wouldn't stop smiling or blushing whenever she was talking about Brayden. It shows how much she adored this man, who she'd never even met in person before. Brayden had even reached out to Teresa via text in December of 2011, introducing himself and assuring her that he was utterly serious about his relationship with Renee. The couple's relationship was turning serious, so much so that in January of 2012, Renee and Kamala went to a tattoo parlor called Bondi Inc., where Renee got Brayden's name tattooed onto her chest. But everything was far from perfect. As Renee's relationship with Brayden was getting intense, her friendship with Kamala had turned sour. Renee noticed that Kamala was overly involved in everything Renee did, and she felt as though Kamala wanted to control everything about Renee's life. It's safe to say that Kamala was suffocating Renee with her relentless control, but Renee didn't seem to notice. Around the same time, Teresa started to get an unsettling feeling about Brayden and found him to be very rude, jealous, and arrogant because he would always be upset when Renee was seen with another man. Apparently, Brayden wanted Renee all to himself and he was overly possessive of her, whenever Renee even interacted or smiled at another man. This behavior led to Renee contemplating ending the relationship, but Brayden had news for Renee that led her to stay with him. He was scheduled to be released in August of 2012, and Renee was over the moon about this. She would finally get to see her online boyfriend for the first time, and she was beyond excited. But soon, things took an unexpected turn that led Renee to do something very tragic. See, Brayden wasn't granted release from prison in August after all, and this news saddened Renee to no end, which led her to attempt self-harm by overdose in September of 2012, and she was rushed to the emergency room. This was extremely difficult for Renee's family, as she was extremely transfixed on this random man to the point where she even attempted to end it all. It's just so sad to see the wave of emotions and distress Renee was going through, and it's very clear to see Renee was not well. She needed some serious intervention. Teresa couldn't bear to see her daughter in pain, and she decided to take a significant step to help her daughter. Teresa reached out to Brayden and demanded that he let Renee be free to pursue other people while he was serving his sentence. When Brayden gets released, then they can think things over. 
Brayden initially backed off, but was still in contact with Renee as friends. Renee actually got into a relationship with another man named Ian, and he was very polite, caring, and genuinely loved Renee. But their relationship took a turn for the better, and the couple even got engaged in January of 2013, though Renee's happiness only lasted for so long. See, during her relationship with Ian, Renee was still in constant communication with Brayden, even though they were just friends. This understandably bothered Ian, so in March of 2013, Ian gave Renee an ultimatum to choose either him or Brayden. Sadly, Renee was still very much in love with Brayden, and she called off her engagement with Ian, a man who could have made Renee happier than ever, but instead she chose her so called soulmate, Brayden. This was a choice that would cost Renee everything. Fast forward to July of 2013. Renee had started a new job, and her co-workers knew about her relationship with Brayden. But around the same time, Brayden went completely radio silent. Renee assumed that it was because of the ongoing court case. Renee regularly reached out to Brayden, but never got a response for almost a month. She was spiraling out of control, and even her co-workers noticed her decline. Little did they know that soon, everything would come crashing down in the worst way possible. It was August 5th of 2013. After bombarding Brayden with countless texts, Renee finally got a response back. But this text would wipe the smile clean off of Renee's face and cement her horrible fate. Brayden texted Renee asking for space, wanting to break up with her, saying, I need a break and so do you. When Renee received this text, she was out with her coworker Joseph for lunch, and upon reading it, she cried and shook hysterically. Renee left work early that day and proceeded to make a 90-second call to Goldburn Jail to talk to Brayden at around 2.44 p.m. Renee wanted to know the reason for the abrupt breakup, but she could never get a hold of Brayden. A distraught Renee went home, all the while still texting Brayden. Teresa was worried about Renee, and she was still very emotional, even though Renee assured her that nothing was wrong. But Teresa soon realized that something was, in fact, very wrong when a text from Brayden came in, stating, quote, Sort your daughter out. She's threatening to end her life. A frantic Teresa immediately rushed to her daughter's side, but was surprised to find her getting ready for a girl's night out. She was wearing black tights, a black sweater, and a black and brown scarf and black ballet flats. Renee appeared calm and wasn't hysterical or sad, which eased some of Teresa's tension. Renee then left her house at around 5.22 p.m., but she wasn't going to meet up with friends. CCTV footage showed her driving towards the Gap, an ocean cliff in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, overlooking the Tasman Sea. But what's alarming and frightening about the Gap is the fact that it's a famous spot for people attempting to end their own lives. This fact, combined with Renee's heartbroken state, was a dangerous combination. There are multiple CCTV cameras and even a safety fence surrounding the perimeter of the cliff, but Renee was tragically determined to put an end to her ongoing misery. She parked her car, a red Mazda near the Gap, and sent several messages to Brayden. It even sent her mom, Teresa, a final farewell message. Renee told Teresa that she loved her and that she was sorry for the pain she was going to put her through. At 5.51 p.m., Renee climbed over the fence at Jacob's Ladder, and three minutes later, she threw her phone into the thrashing waters before tragically jumping off the cliff. 20-year-old Renee fell victim to the dark voices in her head, and she ended her life after getting dumped by her boyfriend of 18 months. Teresa, upon receiving Renee's final message, tried calling and texting Renee frantically, pleading with her to answer her phone, but it was too late. Renee had already made a grave choice, and sadly, there was no turning back from this tragedy. Sydney police were notified immediately, and from Renee's phone activity, her car was found near the Gap at 8.45 p.m., with the words, I love you, Brayden, etched on the dusty car's windshield. Inside the car, there was a photo collage of Brayden, Renee's wallet, and an iPhone with a pink case. Investigators also looked at the CCTV footage and saw Renee leaping off the cliff, which is just so eerie and devastating that something so tragic and unfortunate like this was caught on camera. An aerial search was conducted in hopes of finding Renee's body, but nothing came up and her body hasn't been found still to this day. It's believed that Renee's body drifted away into the deep sea and it was extremely devastating and life-altering for her family, who lost her in such a tragic way. Teresa, after Renee's tragic passing, angrily reached out to Brayden, but he never picked up. She also notified the police of Brayden, and they went to Goldburn Jail to question him. But now, it was their turn to be baffled. 
Dolburn jail authorities confirmed there was no inmate under the name of Braden Spiteri. This left the detectives and Renee's family dumbfounded. Who was Braden? Why did he string Renee along for 18 months, and where was he now? Well, Braden turned out to be someone extremely close to the Marsden family. And ironically, Braden wasn't even a guy, or even real for that matter. Braden wasn't a figment of Renee's imagination. Renee had unfortunately been catfished. But what was even more appalling was the person behind this debacle. It was none other than Renee's best friend, Kamala Zayden. The same person who apparently helped Renee through her breakup with Angus, and was there with Teresa looking for Renee on the day of her passing. She was the one who emotionally played with Renee to the point where she felt she had no choice but to end her own life. Kamala, even though she was Renee's best friend, wanted more from her. It was evident that Kamala was obsessed with Renee from the get-go. Renee's cousin Stephanie recalled Kamala being very violent and aggressive towards Renee when she didn't pay attention. Stephanie also confessed that Renee confided in her about Kamala trying to make advances towards her. But how did all of this start? Well, Kamala is suspected to be the one who severed the relationship between Angus and Renee, because Kamala wanted Renee all to herself and soured the blooming love between the couple, so that they would eventually break up. Kamala had a history of terrorizing Renee on multiple occasions. She reportedly cornered Renee in a library forcefully grabbed her arm outside of a cafe, and even swerved Renee's car while driving. She vowed to always follow Renee if she was ignored. This woman clearly had issues. Kamala wanted to possess and have total control over Renee. And this obsession went beyond romantic feelings and was very dangerous, which is why Renee tried to cut things off with Kamala when she went to the United States for a vacation a few months prior to her tragic passing. But Kamala wanted to get back at Renee twice as hard. At that time in 2013, phone companies erased all text messages and data after seven days. So retrieving them after almost seven years, well, it was difficult. But in February of 2020, the police discovered the full intensity of Kamala's evil and elaborate plan. For 18 months, Kamala pretended to be Brayden and used two cell phones to send Renee messages. The reason why Renee and Brayden got along so well was because Renee was practically and unknowingly talking to Kamala who knew exactly what Renee liked and disliked. But what about Brayden's photos? Was that some graphic design that Kamala had whipped up? Well, no, it turns out that the guy in the picture was a real person and was completely uninvolved in Renee's tragic end. He was a man named Cameron Lang, and he crossed paths with none other than Kamala at a nightclub years ago where they took a picture together. Cameron, an innocent man who didn't even know Renee, was exploited by an evil and manipulative woman. The detectives also noticed the tone of the texts. Whenever Brayden got angry with Renee, Kamala also bombarded Renee with messages of a similar undertone and vice versa. This confirmed and left no doubts in anybody's mind that Kamala was in fact Brayden. With all of this information, the investigators confronted Kamala, who knew that the jig was up and there was no way out for her. Kamala confessed that Brayden was in fact her, but she went on to elaborate. Kamala stated that she and Renee were in a romantic relationship, and since they knew that Renee's family would never approve of their relationship, they decided to stay in touch with each other under the alias of Brayden. Now, Kamala's statement has been termed as a pack of lies, and Renee's family don't believe her at all. They state that Renee didn't know who Brayden was and that Kamala was behind this ruse, and this could basically be proven by the tattoo of Brayden's name that Renee got on her chest. The Marsden family stated that Renee was truly in love with Brayden, or the idea of him, and didn't know that it was Kamala behind the screen at all. Kamala stressed on the fact that Renee was attracted to men as well as women, even though this has never been confirmed. In fact, Renee's relationship history also showed that she only ever pursued, romantically, men in her two very serious relationships. Unfortunately, since there aren't any laws regarding catfishing, and since Kamala didn't physically cause Renee's passing, there were no charges against her. She was allowed to walk free, even after luring a young and vulnerable woman to her tragic end. What Kamala did is technically 100% legal, and there's zero chance she'll ever be held accountable for it, even though she single-handedly caused the tragic passing of her best friend. It's so baffling and distressing to know that Kamala won't ever pay for what she led Renee to do, knowing good and well just how fragile Renee was. 
Camilla's actions and constant hot and cold behavior under the facade of Brayden cost Renee her happiness and eventually her life. As for Camilla these days, she's been living her best life without caring that her actions drove her so-called best friend to the point of no return. As of now, Camilla is married to a man and even started a family. Camilla, the same woman who had a relentless and unhealthy obsession with Renee, moved on with her life and married a man even though she claimed at that time to only be interested in women, specifically Renee. This is what leads to questions like, for what purpose did Camilla make Renee go through the perpetual cyclone of emotions and hopelessness for 18 months? Did Camilla get some sort of sick satisfaction from controlling Renee's life? And did she somehow think that when Brayden broke up with her that it would drive her into Renee's arms? It's just so infuriating to see how easily Camilla has moved on from this, knowing that she directly caused Renee to make such a tragic choice without any punishment, not even a slap on the wrist. Camilla is living her life, but Renee will never get to continue hers. Renee, a once vibrant and cheerful young woman, had been completely blinded by love and desperation, and she failed to see things with reason and logic. And that mistake led to her taking her own life in utter hopelessness. Renee had plans for her upcoming 21st birthday and wanted to move into her own apartment with her cousin, Stephanie. But everything that Renee planned never reached completion, and she was driven to the point where she felt she had no choice but to end her own life. Renee's family, including her mother, Teresa, and her siblings, will likely never heal from the loss, and Camilla's lack of remorse for her actions makes their suffering even harder. The fact that Camilla frequently visited the Marsden home because she and Renee were best friends cuts Teresa to the bone because she never even anticipated that the person in their home would be the one to drive her daughter to such a frightening point. And the fact that she was wearing a facade the entire time is just so brutal. Following Renee's demise, the Marsden family is fighting hard to introduce Renee's law, which deems catfishing and any form of non-physical abuse illegal and creates a distinct criminalization of such heinous acts and behavior. Even though there hasn't been any progress or overnight changes in how catfishing is dealt with legally, the petition highlighted the need for catfishing to be taken seriously and implementation of stricter actions for any type of emotional abuse or manipulation. Laws like this are just so complicated though, because it blurs the lines between free speech and a crime, which no political leader wants to get involved in. It's really easy to judge someone who's subjected to manipulation from a third person perspective. It's easy to criticize them and say, well, why didn't they stop being manipulated? Why didn't they make better choices? But the thing is, you can never understand what the victim is going through. The bottom line is that Renee was vulnerable. And even though she could have made reasonable and logical decisions, her conscience was clouded by the constant bombardment of Camilla's manipulative and deadly actions. Camilla, knowing that Renee was spiraling down after a breakup with Angus, took advantage of her vulnerability and played emotional games with her for over a year. And in the end, Renee lost her will to live and left her family in perpetual grief and sadness. All because she was manipulated and emotionally abused by a monster who was pretending to be a pillar of support. We can only hope that laws dealing with catfishing and penalizing the perpetrators can be made and implemented, not just in Australia, but in other countries too, because Renee's case is a horrific example of something seemingly innocent and playful taking a lethal and unimaginable turn. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a few channel members, including Rakeen Shah and Shauna Tracy. If you also want to become a channel member, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can help keep the channel afloat and help out. I'm extremely grateful to all of you who've decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description if that join button isn't showing up. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.